Welcome to the Metanoia Discourse. My name is Sim, I'm your host, and today's guest is Peter Lakatos. I found Peter through Krav Maga Global as a friend suggestion on Facebook, and little did I know about the amount of influence ex- he'd exert over me from a distance. In the course of the last few years, we've messaged briefly on things when I had questions about the things that he shared on Facebook, which is where I've been digging into the posts he made, reading basically everything he put out that I found interesting that had to do with biology and physiology, training, breeding, and I I really dug into that. So Peter is a really impressive individual. He holds a Krav Maga expert level three, has a master instructor position at Strong First, a a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt under Carlson Gracie Hungary, and he has a deep knowledge on nutrition and physiology. He's also a Buteyuko and Oxygen Advantage instructor, and he's made a specific breeding course just for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athletes or people that do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Peter, for me, has definitely been a mentor and an inspiration from afar. We started off with talking about how he was growing up under Soviet rule, then we'll go into how he got into training, how he met Eyal Yanilov, who is the founder of Krav Maga Global. And from there, we go into how he got into kettlebells. We did a deep dive on keto and carnivore. We geek out a little bit on the mechanisms behind it and his reasoning and a lot of really interesting things that, that he told me about one of his main reasons for having gone the ketogenic route and then the reasons why he's gone the carnivore route. And these are mechanisms that are not mentioned or outlined that much by other people, which is why I found it fascinating myself and and good to share with others. We also briefly venture into biohacking in the last part, and then that's where we end the conversation. So there's a lot of information and bits in here that everyone can use or delve into or look into themselves and I hope you found it as insightful as I did. Okay, great. I'm here with Peter Laketos. So he holds a Krav Maga instructor uh, level, the expert level three. Uh, he's also a master instructor at Strong First. Um, it also does a lot of the, the biohacking that we'll get into later. But... Um, the, the the major topic that we're going to talk about or the, the the intention with the podcast is to talk about his journey so we all get a, an insight as to how his practices have developed and how these have impacted or changed his his way of life in in meaningful uh, in meaningful ways all right so peter thank you for coming on and uh let's get into it so tell me a little bit about growing up in uh, hungary now first of all thank you for inviting and uh, yeah, so so basically till 1989, uh, we had uh, communism mixed with socialism. So that was mm-hmm. it in Hungary. And that's the Eastern Bloc or behind the Iron Curtain, as mm-hmm. you know, they called. And um, so basically, we, those who, who were born uh, around like uh, 1970, like myself, mm-hmm. got mainly the, the softer, uh, part of the communism or, or socialism. So, so the horror stories we heard, which happened to our parents or our grandparents, it was for us. It was stories that you know were coming from people we we knew. So we definitely knew they those stories were real, mm-hmm. but it didn't happen to us. So, so that was very interesting, uh, and everything was centralized and organized basically so yeah. so in my case as a kid uh people came to the school and they were checking out smaller kids and um, we talk about like eight years old nine years old and they were checking uh measure you and and also checking reflexes and all kind of stuff so i just can't remember i just remember david there and 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 they picked me for handball for whatever reason and yeah. then um so I went for handball, and which I loved, by the way. So it was a torture. And then I, I stuck with, with handball for many years. And I, I played on high level, uh, not super high level, of mm-hmm. course, not national team. But but uh, I was part of a, a Division One team. And then um, 
and then uh, the Iron Cur Curtain fall, basically. Mm. So it's 1989. So basically, when I was in the army, because it was mandatory at that mm. time to be in the army, that was the exact time when the Iron Curtain fall. So that was very interesting to see from inside how the system just couldn't handle the whole thing. They, 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 of course, you cannot call anybody anymore comrade. So, mm -hmm. you know, they had to come up with something else. So, that, so the yeah. whole thing was ki kind of hilarious, but, mm -hmm. but as being in, inside, that was, it was somehow scary because that was so interesting. You, you never knew what's going to happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Okay, that's like when you when you were in the military. How long did it take for you to a, after the Iron Curtain fall to get back to being a civilian? So that was very easy. Um, that was that was no problem. Uh, mm. Again, the 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 situation was much softer, mm. and of course, the expectation from uh, from the big change was huge mm. uh, from the whole population, of mm. course, because. Hungary was never part of the East. Mm -hmm. It was always part of the West. And then, uh, of course, after the Second World War, that's what happened. So we mm -hmm. stuck there with the, with our Soviet friends. <laughs> um, so, so, but but uh, we we never agreed with that. We always mm -hmm. felt occupied. We always felt it's uh, mm -hmm. it's something against our will. So, so basically. Uh, the Hungarians are not very good to to follow regulations and rules, to be honest. And uh, and uh, no matter where it comes from, to be, mm. and 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 that type of thinking that now here are the Soviets and and now who knows for how long they're gonna stay. Mm. Uh, definitely, and they stay for fifty years. Uh, so that definitely definitely made our life uh, very difficult. Yeah. When you got out of the army, what, what, what was that process like in the sense of, of getting your first job? Because I guess like maybe back then you weren't really uh, health oriented or interested. Maybe well, That was 1990 and 91. So this is when mm. I'm about to get out from the army. And um, mm. basically we didn't know what to do with one of my friends. Mm -hmm. So we opened a small gym. Oh, okay, so right cool. Away, we opened a small gym. We mm -hmm. we found a place to rent out. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 1990, so not the only thing you could buy on market was basically the bumper plates and the the barbells. So, mm -hmm. so anything else was beyond. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a tradition in in my family that all the males uh, has to get some uh, profession regarding to iron. So my job was. Mm -hmm. Uh, locksmith basically so that's okay that's, uh, the, the profession I, I studied mm -hmm. so with my friend we decided so if we have no money to 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 buy the all the equipment and machines so we just make them so we did all right so it took about cool. six months and and we did everything and it, it looked actually pretty good mm -hmm. so it looks semi-professional let's put it this way <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's amazing. All right. So you guys like I found a little place, made all your own equipment. And is that kind of where your your journey started, let's say, when it comes to like all the, the health and training things that you've Yes, definitely. Into? Definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, first we trained ourselves and then we started uh, people came and then we started to train them. Mm -hmm. They had questions. We had to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. So we had to read. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so we started to get better on the mm -hmm. fly, uh, yeah. and and I don't think we ever got really good, but uh, <laughs> okay, but uh, but we definitely had the enthusiasm to help mm -hmm. other people, and we had the place, and uh, we, mm -hmm. we are living in a small town, uh, not too far from Budapest, so there was no other gym, so we definitely, mm -hmm. um, you know, met with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's great. Do you still remember some of the earliest resources you started reading back at that time? Well, at that time, there were only things from um, uh, professional bodybuilding magazines. And, mm. uh, and we were basically kids, so we had no idea that what is true, what is not true. Mm. And uh, so we tried to boil down the information from what we read. But, but most of the things were 
naturally not true in, in mm. these magazines, right? Mm. And yeah. then you try to follow and you, you figure out like, well, wait a second, this is not for average human beings. Mm. So, and then that time uh, we didn't speak um, any uh, other language than Hungarian, uh, mm -hmm. except some Russian, which didn't help. So, <laughs> so we, we couldn't get any uh, literature to, to go mm -hmm. through. So, so it went on for, for a, a couple of years. And again, by experience and by uh, other people who were more experienced than us, we started to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, did you started because I remember from some of the posts that you made that you had several gyms, right? So did that mm -hmm. sort of develop into its own chain? Yeah. So then, then uh, basically we were so good in this gym business. So, mm -hmm. so we, we, we got bankrupt and uh, <laughs> okay. so, so I, I, I went to work for another company, uh, which mm -hmm. was completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. Was in the media, and then uh, and then I I got there a pretty high position over the years, and then mm. I started to feel like, well, that's not what I want to do anyway. Mm. And this is when I when when I met with Ayal, started to study Krav Maga, okay. uh, met with uh, Tommy, started to learn mm. uh, kettlebell training, mm. and then at one point I said, well, probably I should not work for a company. Not that I had mm. any problem with the company. Mm -hmm. a company i don't believe in the mission yeah. so probably probably i should do something on my own and not because i wanted to be on my own just because mm -hmm. because uh, they goal and my goal was different yeah. so so i did and and that was a huge risk risk back then with mm -hmm. uh, two small children but we decided with my wife let's do it so so That's basically amazing. Basically, we started to uh, started with one gym and then mm. came another and another. So, so we started to have like uh, a, a small gym chain, and they were like small gyms. So don't don't mm. expect something like a huge mm. uh, company. But we were we were always small. Mm. So what around what time was that? Because you you mentioned the y'all, so you got into Krav Maga around the same time. So it's like two thousand two. Mm is when I started to, to study Krav Maga, I believe. How did you get turned on to that? I mean, it, it seems like in Hungary, like how did it pop up oh, there? I, you know, it, these are things that uh, when you look back, you are like, well, this was just so amazing. Mm -hmm. So so again, um, my wife is, is American, right? And then, so we were in the States visiting one of our, one of her friend, uh, later my friend too, and um, he was working for LAPD mm -hmm. uh, and he was basically part of the education unit, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we visit them, you know, having some family uh, dinner with them. And as we are leaving the house, he comes to me and like, he says like, oh, by the way, are you interested in self-defense? Mm -hmm. and, and my wife is already at the door. So I'm looking mm -hmm. at my wife like, I guess, I'm, yeah. And he's like, wait a second. So then he runs away, comes back, brings a, uh, a plastic pistol. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And he's like, point, point the, the gun on me. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? I just pointed at me. I'm like, okay. He's like, don't be surprised. I'm like, okay. So I pointed at him and he's, you know, he's punching the heck out of me. Yeah. Right. I mean, on, on my chest and take mm -hmm. the gun away in, in less than a second. And I'm just standing there like, oh, wow. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, okay, so uh, since you are leaving already, just two things you have to remember that this is called Krav Maga. This is what we study at the LAPD. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, remember the name uh, AI Anilov. So Google, or I don't know if there was Google yet, well, something. So go, go on the internet and find mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. So I went on the, on the website, and which was a, a horrible website back then. It was a very <laughs> primitive web, website. So uh -huh. I went on, I found Eyal, and I found that he was coming to Budapest in a couple of, like two months, something mm -hmm. like that. And I go, oh, that's interesting. So I, I went to the, to the event, and, and I, I liked it. So like, oh, mm -hmm. that's, I think that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. It's funny because both um, with Tommy Blom, he said it was kind of a fluke and sort of the same thing here where it's like you you were exposed to it in a 
yeah, in a rather interesting scenario, you know, yeah. because I, for a lot of people that came in later, um, as Krav Maga got bigger, then, then it's like, you know, more of the, the, the marketing that got people in, but this is really like, it's just somebody that talked to you about it and, and here you are. Right. So yeah. that's, that's really cool. And uh, as far as that, the uh, experience with Krav Maga goes, because then I guess as time went on, you also wanted to start instructing and you at some point or still are, I think, the director of Hungary. Yes, but at this point, since we have all these lockdowns, I mean, uh, that position means almost nothing. So <laughs> yeah. like I'm a right. director of nothing because we don't do nothing, basically. Mm. Gotcha. So what we are trying to do is keeping our instructors um, mm. somehow in mm. the line and helping them and because mm. all the gyms are closed and even more closed than than we hoped by this time mm. so we started to feel like you know the groundhog day we are running in circles and uh we are uh mm. locking down after locking down so 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 but what what yeah so that's that's one of the position i'm doing yes mm. mm -hmm. but what made you want to instruct back in the day it was it because you wanted to like share that like wow moment with other people and you wanted to give them that yes. the, well the means it's, right again Eyal's personality is definitely mm -hmm. something that uh, again if somebody is listening this uh, podcast or watching this podcast and here's the name but never had any mm -hmm. um any uh, meeting with Ayal or never seen him and, and mm. a video doesn't give it back uh, mm. but what the I mean basically over the years he became family members so when he's in Hungary mm. he's staying in our house he's still growing up my kids so mm. so he's definitely like a, like a, a, an older advisor uncle mm. I would say that but but again, his influence on on many people's life is 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 amazing. I mean, I, I'm I'm nothing but thankful to, uh, what what he did over the years. Mm -hmm. Not that he would uh, ask for any thanks or anything because that's not his nature. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, so it's it in, interesting. Yeah, great. And then when um when along that journey did you get exposed to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? So I was getting ready for my expert one, I believe expert one exam. And uh, and there are a lot of grand stuff on, on it. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to practice a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a bunch of videos, these Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys. And I was like, that's very interesting. So one of my friend was then a blue belt, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to him and then he crushed me like, like nothing i'm like this is ridiculous i mean i'm stronger than him mm -hmm. i'm doing this krav maga stuff and naturally of course he could crush me because it was on the ground so he had mm -hmm. i had no chance but anyway <laughs> and then and then i started to also in the same time started to uh study kettlebell training right so mm -hmm. so somehow one of the school called uh, carson gracie uh, mm -hmm. hungary uh, they uh, had coach my master uh, and very good friend of mine. Then he heard about me and he invited me to his team to show kettlebell. Cool. And I was like, okay. So I went there. I saw that a bunch of very interesting person with, uh, you know, broken ears and noses. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And then, uh, so anyway, uh, I, I taught them some courses or events, and then they started to teach me uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm -hmm. and, and I stuck there. And basically, the funny thing was, I didn't really want to study a lot. My thing was like, I just learned something that it's enough for the expert level exam and where I feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and, and I even said, like, I'm not interested in the gi, just no gi. I mean, just leave me alone <laughs> with these pajamas and I don't care. <laughs> yeah. And at one time, yeah, and then one time my, my master said, like, well, it would be nice to try this pajama stuff. Mm. And I was like, nah. Like, no, no, no. Do you have a, a gi? I'm like, yeah, I have an old judo gi somewhere. Like, next time you come to me, come to my house. Don't come mm. to the gym. Come to my house. I show you a few things with the gi. And if you like it, 
we'll see. If you don't like it, that's it. So I went there and he showed me a few things. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a different universe. Mm -hmm. So, so after that, he took me under his wings basically, and uh, and I and I went to his either him to his house or his uh, other black belts mm -hmm. to study uh, the art. And uh, it was I was amazed. I was like, this is just amazing stuff. And mm -hmm. And I stuck there, and I got promoted. So, so I was every single promotion I got. I was I was the most surprised person in the gym. <laughs> yeah. I I never expected. I mean, even the blue belt. I, I didn't even mm -hmm. expect the blue belt. Uh, not to mention the other belts. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, it's it's interesting. That's a very cool journey you've had into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So you mentioned kettlebells. It was it Tommy Blom that turned you on to kettlebells, or how did that enter the picture? Yeah, so Tommy came to our house to teach one course for Krav Maga for mm -hmm. uh, for the organization. So he comes and brings a bunch of CDs, mm -hmm. and so he stayed with us for like two weeks. And at one night he pops up his laptop and it's like, okay, so let me show you something amazing. And mm -hmm. he shows me and I'm like, I don't, Tommy, I, I don't know. It looks kind of stupid. I mean, seriously, I don't know. <laughs> uh, just, seriously, it just doesn't make any sense. And he's like, yeah, I agree. This is stupid. But, but still, why don't we watch the next one? And we are mm -hmm. like, okay, we watch the next one. Like, it still doesn't make any sense. I mean, I mean, why don't you just leave the damn thing? I mean, just you're doing all kind of ballistic stuff with it. Mm -hmm. You know, you never done it, so so our judgment was definitely um, not proper. Mm -hmm. So, but he stayed for two weeks. So every day we watched a little bit, and it, it started to grow on us. And we were like, mm -hmm. well, what if it? What if it's true? What if it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So before he left. Uh, we started to go on the internet and see, like you know, if this. Pavel Tatulian person mm -hmm. will be ever in Europe. And we just figure out next year he will be in Denmark. And we're like, whoa, that's interesting. So we go the price tag, which was like probably two thousand mm. dollars for three okay. days. <laughs> and we were like, whoa, that's really pricey. Uh -huh. But then a couple of days we talked to each other, like, you know what? If you register, I register. Mm. And it was like, yeah, let's do it. So we both registered. Uh, why we didn't even have a, a kettlebell in our hands, of course. <laughs> so that was a different story. But so so we were very, let's say, unprepared to go mm. to the course. Yeah. And uh, and it was very difficult course, especially because we had very little preparation. Mm -hmm. We did it. We passed the test, and uh, which we were very surprised. And um, and then. Basically, I came home from Denmark, and my thing was most probably uh, this was the the worst investment of my life ever. Mm -hmm. Not because the course was bad, because the course was amazing. Mm -hmm. But my thinking was most probably nobody cares about this in Hungary. Mm -hmm. I mean, for many reasons, mm -hmm. uh, the culture is very much about bodybuilding. We just kicked out the Soviets. So now I'm bringing back a Soviet stuff. It just, <laughs> yeah. no way it's going to work. So I had many doubts. And so what mm -hmm. I did basically, uh, I got somehow a few kettlebells, uh, 16 kilo, 24 kilo, and maybe a 12. And between Krav Maga trainings, I was just swinging kettlebells, doing Turkish get-ups and such. And, and mm -hmm. my students were like, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is uh, Russian stuff. I mean, can we learn? I'm like, ah, oh, no. So, so then, then we had to, uh, I had to buy a bunch of kettlebells because, of course, that was not available on the market. Mm -hmm. And we started to set up groups, and and it was very interesting because almost like, so at that point I was, I had like about 120, about 100, 120 uh, uh, Krav Maga uh, trainers, Krav Maga mm -hmm. trainers under my hand. Mm -hmm multiple uh, groups and I asked them that if anybody interested then you could come to this kettlebell and I would say about good 80% decided to join that's a good so turnout I, I was very I was very surprised and we started mm. to do it and uh, 
and uh, the feedback and uh, the results were crazy. Mm. So we started to spread. So very fast from the first group, people started to ask like, okay, so how can I be a instructor? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Uh -huh. so, so very soon, I mean, next summer, we went to Denmark to get certified with about, I would say about 16, 18 Hungarians and, uh, and most of them got certified. Mm -hmm. And then they started to teach. And then, uh, and then since Denmark finished the contract with back then with uh, the Dragon Door company, mm -hmm. and we already had a, a rather big operation in uh, in Hungary. So then, uh, then Pavel decided that uh, we we start uh, the whole thing over in in Hungary, which we did. So we had um, certification for sometimes uh, ninety two hundred ten people. Wow. So, so ground much, zero and, in Europe for the kettlebell yeah. movement. <laughs> so pretty much today, everybody who is a um, kind of big name in in K uh, in um, in strong first mm -hmm. most likely got certified for the level one in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Just pretty pretty awesome. Uh, and 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 those courses were uh, a logistic nightmare. If mm -hmm. you think about like just think about like 110 people, how many kettlebells? uh so yeah. that was crazy i mean for two days we've been just packing kettlebells and nothing else <laughs> so that was that was definitely a nightmare but anyway it was a lot of fun so mm. looking back it was it was a crazy experience yeah but it, like it, it's an investment that paid off in the end right because i remember when i went to budapest and i talked to this guy because i i asked you in advance that's I think almost four years ago now about like a, a CrossFit style gym and you you recommended me one and then I went there and talked to the guy and when I mentioned your name I was like oh yeah the kettlebell guy I was like uh yeah sure <laughs> so you're you're definitely uh, yeah like a landmark person in the movement yeah I you know I, I I never tried to be the the second Pavel or something like that because again I, I respect my my teachers, so I'm not trying to copy them in a way that I'm stealing their thunder or anything. But 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 definitely the kettlebell itself is such a unique tool, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you you didn't have it in in your country before. Mm -hmm. um, that they started to identify me as a kettlebell guy, and and to be honest, I it didn't bother me ever. Mm. But I always felt like that's not, not not what I want to do. So I don't want to be identified as the kettlebell guy because that's yeah. Pavel. So I, mm. that doesn't make any sense. Mm. So I always said like, no, I'm the I'm the guy who is training with kettlebells and by the way with many other things. But people say to identify me as oh yeah, I'm the kettlebell guy. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Come, comes with the territory at times when you're leading that uh, yeah, I guess. Or like that wave, right? But um, speaking of movement, uh, you also. Uh, started or, or founded the ground force method, mm -hmm. which is a, a yeah a movement protocol or program based on natural movements. We, me and Tommy Blonde talked about it a little bit. I'm certified in it, and it was one of the things that um, uh, was a window into yeah movement for me because when I started, you know, the Edo Portal thing wasn't that big yet. And it was mm -hmm. one of the first interactions I had with like natural movement in the sense of locomotion and, and the, yeah. the crawling and stuff. And, and again, you know, that we we studied so many things over the years mm. from from Ayal, his warm-ups, for example, mm. uh, warm-ups from judo, um, movements from Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. FMS, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 many styles we we got uh, introduced to and mm. uh, principles and methods. So it was very logical to create a system and not because we wanted to be better than others, but because we understood the principles a little bit different mm -hmm. because again, we were standing on the foundation of FMS. That was always a thing. So whenever somebody showed me a movement, I was like, hmm, does it make any sense mm -hmm. uh, on, on, the, on the foundation of FMS? Mm -hmm. if, if it does, is it, a, is it more like a progression or regression? Mm -hmm. How do we teach this, right? Mm -hmm. How can we break it down into details? How, where does it fit by position, by movement, by 
by the ontogenesis of a, of a, a little kid. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was always the question about everything. And sometimes we, we found amazing movement just didn't fit mm -hmm. uh, to the principle. So I'm like, okay, that movement is great, but we will not use it. And people got really angry, like, but it's a great movement. Yeah, but it doesn't fit. So again, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, but again, we started to see this as, and we started to show it to people and people went nuts. Mm. And, and, and they were like, you know, can we learn this system? And we were like, well, it's not even a system yet. <laughs> and they and then we started to think, well, actually, we should make it into a system. Mm. So we started to outline the, the principles and uh, creating the manuals and everything. And then at, at one point, we were like, I, I think we are ready. I think mm. we can up, roll this out for a test group. And, and we did. Mm. And we get um, amazing reviews back. And we're like, okay, so apparently we can do something with it. Mm. And, and we always kept it as an open source system. So if somebody comes and, and they understand clearly the principles and said like, well, how about this? And it makes sense and it, or, or it's a better solution than ours. Mm. We are like, we're happy to steal it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a, a, a fun exploration and it, it always, yeah. Like it got people involved in different ways than the you know the the standard warm ups that are mm -hmm. quite inherent in in martial arts which i mean a lot of times they're they're not very creative they're they're i mean it's not about the creativity but it it, it doesn't really get people engaged as much right it's a mm -hmm. lot of the, the the old school practices i mean there's nothing wrong with them per se but this is a little bit more lively it's a more dynamic the introduction of the games definitely gave it a new element and it primed people states to 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 start yes. doing right uh, the what what we what we want from them the, the fighting elements so, so but uh yeah it's been it's been a very cool experience to to teach that to people and and experience people's responses to it mm. thank you mm -hmm. so yeah it's been a it's been cool to to do that quite early on i think i got certified i think it's almost seven years ago now mm. and it's something that i've used as a as a tool quite often and funnily enough uh, i worked as a personal trainer so i, I used all of those elements with clients um but like i said before i got turned on to to edo portal stuff and in like back then uh that's uh, six years ago yeah, or six to five years ago, then nobody was doing any type, any type of natural movement, locomotion style, uh, warm ups, or, or any type of prep in the gym. So it was, I was a really odd duck, let's say, when mm -hmm. when it came to training people in the in the gyms here. So, but yeah, it was a, it, it's it's very fun, and it's something that I like always recommend people to to look into because it's yeah like. We lo lose contact with a lot of these natural movements, right? So we stop crawling around and we stop rolling around. And I think uh, the rolling, especially um, from what I know or have been learning about the proprioception and the vestibular system, which is like the, the ears, right? For people that don't know what that is, the, the liquid in the ears and how the body maps yourself in time and space. That's been one of the, the really interesting things on myself and that I see in other people, like how much better their, yeah, their body map becomes, right? Their awareness mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. where they are and how they're moving and allows them to get a better sense of things that, yeah, that, that, that it wasn't there before, right? Because you stop doing these movements, ergo the, like the body map and your proprioceptive capacity sure. diminishes, right? So that's, that's also been a very interesting because I think in a lot of cases, a lot of people look at these types of things and go just go like oh but it's just a movement but neglect the uh well the vestibular thing and then of course like the, if it's vestibular it means it's neurological so there's a huge mm. neurological benefits of doing a lot of those natural movements um sure yeah so yeah that's been a a, a very interesting uh tie-in for me when I, when I started learning about the vestibular system and neurology. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your nutrition because you were actually one of the first guys to uh, put me 
on to keto, which was an interesting mm. experience because it wasn't really something that I was um, familiar with at all. Uh, <laughs> of course, like I come, I come from Belgium, right? So the diet there, it's like, you know, you have your vegetables, you have your potatoes and some protein and nobody really thinks about anything else. And that's kind of like the standard mm-hmm. yeah, way your, your meal is uh, constructed, right? So I talked to Tom and Blom about the warrior diet because he turned me on to that. And when I started fasting, that was like a big a paradigm mm-hmm. shift for me, completely weird for my parents, right? I mean, you, you stopped eating throughout the day, which was very weird. And then as time grew, right, I got more interested in nutrition. And then the, the things you've posted on Facebook, uh, I think that's around like four years ago that really got me interested into keto. I was like, okay, this is the one of the weirdest things I, I've heard about having a higher fat diet. But uh, yeah, let, let me just share a little bit of your experiences, how you so, got into yeah, it. And- so, you know, it, there is a war uh, for maybe a hundred years mm. about, you know, the macros. Like, you know, mm. sometimes the carb is the evil sometimes the fat is evil sometimes Mm -hmm. the protein is evil and they are just keep going around and Mm -hmm. then so i i started to study nutrition when the carb was the evil guy right Mm -hmm. so low carb was everything then paleo was everything then Mm -hmm. before that atkins was everything Mm -hmm. and then of course the next um, logical step was naturally keto Mm -hmm. and and the only thing was that time which which we followed is just simply you know, it doesn't really what you eat just just no carb that's mm-hmm. it just no carb mm-hmm. you didn't measure nothing and, and 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 then and then somebody said some clever guys like yeah you can actually measure the the ketones because ketogenic diet means that there might be some ketones in your blood so mm-hmm. like oh okay that's interesting so we started to to measure uh, blood ketones and and of course uh, at that point everybody is like you know who has the best blood ketones you know and, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense but it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter you just follow the the, the tribe mm-hmm. and so so for me this low carb paleo and then keto movement only started to really make sense even though I was following it for some years. Mm-hmm. When I met with uh, Professor Boros, who mm-hmm. is uh, basically uh, uh, an MD originally, but also a PhD in biochemistry, and he's teaching at uh, UCLA, mm-hmm. and he's a Hungarian uh, origin uh, professor, mm-hmm. and and I was lucky enough to to become his his I, probably I can say his student. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and he introduced me to another gentleman called uh, Gabor Shomui. He's a PhD. And so these two people, in my opinion, but not only in my opinion, uh, already should get Nobel Prize mm-hmm. for what they've done, uh, the things they come up with. And it's very simple. And this is where I will go back in, to the to the ketogenic diet because then. Always the question is what makes ketogenic diet better than the others? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and some people will say because carbs are evil. No, no, not really, but that's a different mm-hmm. issue. So, so then comes a different direction and the direction is called deuterium, right? Mm-hmm. So, so this is what we can talk about, like um, everything what we eat, especially water, what we drink. Mm-hmm. So it has... Uh, a different type of hydrogen in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are light, there are medium size, and they are heavy. And the heavy is definitely we don't deal about it because that those are the super heavy. But anyway, mm-hmm. the the medium size, which called deuterium, uh, that is a little bastard apparently. Mm-hmm. And the reason is very simple: its size and its weight is double than the the normal H two O hydrogen. Mm-hmm. But still going to the same uh, um, attachment with 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 oxygen, so it's still mm-hmm. water, mm-hmm. but a little bit different structure. It's bigger, heavier. Mm-hmm. So so apparently the deuterium content of the of what we drink, what we eat, 
has a lot to do with how our cells are working and how our mitochondria are working. Mm -hmm. And at one point, these deuterium, when it's higher in uh, in uh, uh, numbers, and they call it uh, parts per million, so PPM. Mm -hmm. So when it's higher, then definitely over the time they can cause damage. And we talk about mechanical damage. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a very interesting subject. So when we have a mitochondrium on the mitochondrium membrane, mm -hmm. uh, there are different complexes. There are five complexes, and uh, every single complex is basically throwing uh, uh, an electron to the next one. Mm -hmm. But at the end, and also pumping a, a hydrogen ion to the intermembrane space. But that that is not interesting until you reach the last complex, and then. Um, then that's a protein basically mm -hmm. and what is amazing it's a protein which is looks and acts like a rotor mm -hmm. so it's a mechanical thing so right. it just it's beyond my my brain how is how mm -hmm. is it and just have you have to understand like we have cells which have some of them cells doesn't have mitochondria but most of the cells has mitochondria and uh, some of those have probably between 1,000, 2,000, even 200,000, uh, mm -hmm. maybe 20,000 for the heart cell. Uh, so, so there are, just imagine like the teeny tiny cell, it has like, let's say 5,000 mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And every single mitochondria have about 300,000 of these rotors. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, uh, through these rotors, there are the deuterium going through, right? Mm -hmm. With the water, mm -hmm. with the, as, a, as a hydrogen, right? But some hydrogen are good guys and some hydrogens are bigger, heavier, and they're bad guys. And since it's a mechanical issue, because it's a turbine, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a biological turbine. Mm -hmm. So then these bigger guys will eventually break the turbine. Mm -hmm. So in the mitochondria, one by one, these complexes start to break down and when they start to break down the capacity of making atp is definitely challenged so they mm -hmm. shut down mm -hmm. and the cell has to make a decision um, and the decision should be either stopping the 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 life of the cell which would be basically uh, like an apoptotic uh, type of uh, uh, behavior mm -hmm. but the problem is the the mitochondria has the switch to turn off the cell mm -hmm. so not that nucleus has but the, the mitochondria but the mitochondria is damaged so it's no good for anything right now mm -hmm. so the cell cannot really get turned off and unfortunately the cell has to look for a different type of atp production mm -hmm. at that point the cell is basically uh, could go in a different route. And that's mm -hmm. what we know uh, as, as chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. So these two doctors, uh, Professor Boros and, and Dr. Shomiri, who they are both good friends of mine, uh, started to have these researches 30, 30 years ago. So that's, that's oh, wow. crazy. Yeah. 30 years ago. And then, so now the world is catching up. So now we start to see more... Uh, researchers from the states china ukraine mm. and other countries because eventually they figured out the same thing and the same thing is very simple that a, a bunch of chronic disease you can actually heal in water mm -hmm. and and this is when i heard first about that like 20 years ago i was like yeah that's <laughs> that's bullshit <laughs> and and then i had the opportunity to talk to these two um, great scientists mm. personally, and uh, and uh, I could ask my questions, and and they are their knowledge is just thousands of times more than mine. So mm -hmm. I was blown away by the explanation they gave me. How simple they can do this, mm -hmm. and just to make you understand this very water. So again, they come up with a water that they through different uh, reactions, they lower the number of deuterium, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this very water in Hungary is certified as medication for animals. Okay. 
So it just, you know, when people say like, oh, this is just, what is bullshit? This is water. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the, the, this is the best marketing ever. You're selling water. Mm-hmm. I don't but you're selling water for much higher price and it's just still water. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is in Hungary, it's certified as, as a veterinary uh, medication mm-hmm. and they use it as a, as a, in the oncology, in the veterinary oncology, it's yeah. a huge success. I mean, yeah. humongous success. It's really fascinating, but I guess in, in that sense as well, when people aren't very acquainted with biology, it's easy to dismiss water but if you look at what a cell is made out of, it, it all, the, like so much water and all the minerals, and, and it's, what is it's the, kind of important. So. Yes. And when you see the, the cell, I mean, what is the cell is making? What is the mitochondria is making? The mitochondria is making mm. ATP. Okay, mm. cool. What else? Well, we create some CO2. That's, that's also very important. Okay, good. Mm. What else we create? Well, we create heat, of course, mm. because, you know, we, we need some heat, uh, mm-hmm. depending on where do we live. What else it creates? Water. What? What? Why? What are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Why the cell is creating water? And then, yes, the cell is, I mean, the mitochondria is definitely creating water. This water is deuterium depleted water. Mm-hmm. And you can measure that, right? So, so basically, uh, in my mind, the future of, of, medi- uh, of medicine, mm-hmm. you know, you go to the doctor, they do your blood work. But they also will do your your deuterium level check. Mm -hmm. And based on that level, they can say, like, where are you right now Mm -hmm. on general health? That's amazing. Again, it's it's not me saying that. It's these two doctors are saying that, but these two doctors' research is Mm -hmm. saying that. Mm -hmm. So that is just, again, crazy. And And then we know that there are certain deuterium numbers when when the human body is depleted Mm -hmm. it's definitely under a certain level then uh, definitely certain um, uh, uh, illnesses cannot be really present in a in in a way that it can grow Mm -hmm. yeah and again there are many researches Mm -hmm. uh, to do so and 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 again uh i'm I, I'm in almost daily contact with these two scientists, mm. so I can always send my my uh, hostile questions <laughs> to them. Like, well, yeah, but how about this? And mm. then they always can explain. So why why am I doing this? Mm. Why am I saying these things? Because go back to the ketogenic diet. Mm. So so most people goes to to ketogenic diet from a direction of I don't want to have any carbs. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's have a bunch of fat now my ketones are high level mm-hmm. that's great but there are many ways you can elevate your ketone levels uh, mm-hmm. like not eating for two days your <laughs> ketone levels will be pretty high mm-hmm. or training hard your ketone levels will be, will be high so that's very natural now but in a natural ketogenic diet the, the, the thing is and this is what uh, Dr. Shomya was doing one of the doctors he measured a bunch of food out of the market. He just bought a bunch of food mm-hmm. and bought them and, and, and they dried them and powderized them. And then they measured its deuterium content. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, the lowest number was always the fat or uh-huh. the butter. Okay. Yeah. Or, so, so these things were the lowest. I mean, like crazy low numbers, right? Mm-hmm. And anything else was either high or very high mm. like the like um, tap water was really high mm. so at that point um started to look very logical to start eating uh, in a way of a ketogenic way mm. because simply that's a natural way to to limit the amount of deuterium goes to your body mm-hmm. so then that was for me uh, the the, the, the final punch let's put it this way <laughs> when i said like well it's not only like a, a fad mm-hmm. but it's more like something that it totally makes sense biologically mm-hmm. so then then why not so when people are saying that uh 
that ketogenic, ketogenic diet is just a fad, it's stupid and everything. I always say, well, it depends. I mean, if you do it a stupid way, it's a very stupid thing. Mm-hmm. No question. But if you do it in the right way and you know why you do it, and the reason why you do it is because to, to deplete um, mm-hmm. the level of deuterium in your food, uh, because that gives you a bunch of uh, health benefits, mm-hmm. then it's very logical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a, a quite an in-depth view, which I'm I'm super fascinated by, like these things, like how how it works in the mitochondria, because you know, as, as you explained, it's important for your energy production, and that's gonna result in in just how the, or it's gonna express itself in how you're gonna feel on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also wanted to um, ask about how you got involved with the carnivore diet because you've interviewed Sean Baker, you've run mm-hmm. some experiments on it. So how did that come to so be? Again, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Again, the same thing. It's, it's uh, as one of my doctor friends would say, who worked with uh, many patients who mm-hmm. has uh, serious issues, he said, there is something magical about carnivore diet. He said, mm-hmm. I cannot put my finger on it. What is it? Mm-hmm. But it does work. So, and I think it goes back to one very important thing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the, the environmental stress is, is definitely a very interesting thing. And some of them are making us stronger, like training stress is an environmental stress, right? Mm-hmm. And many other things are making us stronger on a, on a level. But there are other stressors that the, 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 the word is over. Uh, expressing on us and mm-hmm. for example um, one of the thing is called leaky gut syndrome LGS mm-hmm. right and leaky gut syndrome is is definitely something that is very much overlooked and uh, not taken serious and such but um, but that we, we know from different researches that leaky gut is a bigger problem than than it was thought or estimated mm-hmm. and and when when the gut uh, tight junctions, so these are the tight connections between the the enterocytes or conocytes. They getting uh, injured uh, or getting uh, chemically uh, removed from each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, these sites, these these cells, then things can go through them. And and the problem is not when they go through the things should go through the, the these mm-hmm. cell lines because somehow we have to get. Uh, amino acids and and the glucose molecules and such, but when bigger molecules are falling through these holes, that that's definitely a problem. This is not what we are designed for, mm-hmm. and that's gonna definitely get the interest from our immune system, mm-hmm. which is about seventy five percent of our in- immune system is around the smallest intestine. So when mm-hmm. these guys are busy, they have they make mistakes like anybody else with mistakes and they starting to tag different proteins as as enemies mm-hmm. and some of those proteins are us basically you mm-hmm. know our thyroid our our pancreas and such and we start to see most more and more illnesses as uh, as uh, a direct or an indirect uh, a manifestation of mm-hmm. making that syndrome mm-hmm. And um, the moment when when you go into a very very limited uh, uh, diet like carnivore diet, mm-hmm. interestingly, most of the things that creates these anomalies are screened out right away mm-hmm. because eventually these most of these things are in either in a, some modern food. Mm-hmm. Which is you know made by the the, the industry mm-hmm. or certain uh, we think good but not always good uh, vegetables and, and other things mm-hmm. right because they try to protect themselves not against us but any anything that try mm-hmm. to eat them and they have the little uh, little uh, toxic chemical arsenal to to make sure that we cannot really digest them and mm. this call, we call them anti nutrient uh, nutrients and, and these uh, nutrients are making sure that they create some kind of disturbance 
uh, around the small intestine and also the the, the big one. Mm -hmm. So so it create discomfort. So we will not eat them again, but we do because it is told those are the super healthy food, right? So mm -hmm. we do eat them. And again, I have nothing nothing uh, to to say against vegetables. I'm not against vegetables at uh, any way. The human uh, race in the last 15 to 20,000 years figured out how to make them available. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, so basically we have only one stomach, right? So, so uh, the human is, you know, the, the thinking was amazing. We have one human, we cannot digest these kind of things. It makes us gassy, it hurts, it's not good. Mm -hmm. We have to eat way too much to get some calorie out. We don't have the enzymes. We don't have the pH, we don't have the bacteria in our gut. So what mm. to do now? Oh, wait a second. Why don't we ferment all these things? Mm. Why don't we create a stomach out of our stomach? Mm -hmm. Right. So let's ferment yeah. all these things. Now it's it's pre-digested. Let's eat now. Oh, now it's mm. good. Okay, now I'm I'm not dying from it. That's great. Let's mm. let's eat this way. Mm. And and this is how it was meant to be for most of the things to eat. Mm fermented uh, but we don't do that fermentation lately because it takes time mm -hmm. so we don't do it so just we eat raw and people are going crazy for raw diets like you know and then and again they are surprised when uh, after some time they start to have issues because because uh, these these toxins are going through the cell lines and creating leaky gut uh, mm -hmm. syndromes mm -hmm. So back to the carnivore, when you are a very strict carnivore, you don't eat any of these. And I'm not saying you never eat these things, but I'm mm -hmm. saying that for, uh, let's say, for 30 days, mm -hmm. you don't eat these things. And then you notice like, whoa, wait a second. Like, apparently my digestion is just improved by a lot. My, mm -hmm. my uh, let's say, uh, C-reactive proteins are measurably lower so there is uh, no uh, that much inflammation interleukin six goes down and etc mm -hmm. and then people are like whoa that's that's very interesting because you know we are learning lately that meat is the only problem we have in the whole world mm -hmm. and then you start to eat the fatty meat and that's very important to understand the fatty meat you eat Mm -hmm. and and suddenly all these numbers are going down like crazy and and probably the one of the best example known right now uh i could say is jordan b peterson's mm -hmm. example and also his daughter's example right yeah, Michaela right. peterson who had multiple uh uh joints mm -hmm. reconstructed at mm. age 15 17 and and such that and and she had such a horrible autoimmune disease and she mm. switched to a pure meat diet and it was blown away very fast and the mm. same thing for jordan peterson who is uh, admittedly having uh, um, depression problems mm. for years Mm -hmm. And he couldn't manage it with with drugs. Actually, he tried, but he had to go to mm -hmm. to go after because as he managed with drugs, he definitely got hooked on it, right? Yeah. And he did mm -hmm. that. So I, I love that guy anyway. And then and then he he also switched to this diet, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly he's feeling perfect. Mm -hmm. So and 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 these are just of course these are case studies, and these are not real uh, clinical. Mm. Uh, studies i got it but but it happens so many times around us right mm -hmm. so when you have all these stories around you you start to give a give, give a maybe a try sometimes uh, especially if you had problems of your own mm -hmm. and that's classical elimination diet if you mm -hmm. say like you know you eliminate everything out which might cause trouble mm -hmm. now the gut getting healed Mm -hmm. And now you make the big decision. Am I starting to reintroduce stuff or I'm staying where I am right now? It's really up to you. Mm -hmm. And some people will start to reintroduce, find out, oh, okay, this is causing again problem. Oh, so that was the problem, that, mm -hmm. that very food. So they will never eat that. But um, this, is, this is how we got, we got here. I mean, uh, we got here eating animals. 
And mm. I'm, I'm very always very careful to say eating meat because that's not what we did. Mm-hmm. We eat the whole animal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, nose to tail. <laughs> nose to tail. Um, and, and we ate mainly the fat again because mm-hmm. that's the most valuable part of the animal and internal organs, which mm-hmm. is again filled with sugar and copper and uh, iron and mm-hmm. uh, B12 and uh, choline and just, just name it. Mm. So, so, and that's very difficult to sell today. So like telling people like, oh yeah, we kind of eating internal organs and they are like, what? <laughs> yeah. And, it's always or, a hard sell to clients anyway to start yeah, um, increasing yeah, their like, organ you intake. Liver? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the liver is full, full with the toxin. Like, mm-hmm. no, <laughs> the liver is removing toxins. Exactly. The liver doesn't hold toxins. So, mm-hmm. so liver is a superfood. You mm-hmm. think avocado is superfood or chia yeah. seed. That's not true. Mm-hmm. The real superfood is probably liver. Mm-hmm. So, and I, so I think there's there's a myth there as well, not just about like the eating the organs, but about the preparation of meat. I think uh, a lot of the um, idea there is that our brain started growing once we were able to cook food, right? But it's clear that we that grains have been grown before our ability to cook food. And I saw that you recently started eating some more uh, raw meat, so. Is that yeah, I mean, part of? There is a scientist called from Israel, by the way. His name mm-hmm. is Miki Bandor, and uh, Miki Bandor was just publishing a study a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And the idea is very simple. So, so there are different ideas. Number one is called the the expensive tissue hypothesis, and the mm-hmm. expensive tissue hypothesis is very simple. Uh, the brain, which is about two percent of our body weight. Mm-hmm. takes about 20-25% of our energy. So it's a very expensive tissue. Mm-hmm. Now, now, if you see other uh, like, uh, like orangutans and uh, gorillas, right? So their brain is smaller, but their gut is a lot bigger mm-hmm. because they're eating mainly uh, all kind of vegetables and such. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, but but what, what the, the current idea is that the, the reason why our uh, uh, small intestine is a lot longer than theirs, but our uh, big intestine is, the colon, is a lot smaller than theirs mm-hmm. because we are, we lost this capacity. Mm-hmm. And then as a return, because we had to grow a bigger brain. Mm-hmm. And, and why do we have to grow a bigger brain? Because somehow, we had to, to, to work together with other humans to hunt big games and then medium games. And then since we were so successful in hunting, mm-hmm. we hunted them down completely. Mm-hmm. So we had to start hunting smaller games. But at that point, the smaller games needed more uh, cooperation, mm-hmm. planning, and etc. Now, again, it's not... Um, not a very old idea as a hypothesis. So that naturally many people are criticizing that. But mm. what, what is, what is uh, very, very important to, to understand that, that uh, and that's what's called the mismatch hypothesis, mm-hmm. that the moment when we are not living our lives according the way we are or were designed, mm-hmm then different uh, uh, problems will occur. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and we definitely, we are not designed to the world we are living in right now. Mm-hmm. And the nutrition is one part of it, but um, there are many other parts of it. So basically what I'm trying to say is, is, is probably anybody who has uh, a critical thinking Mm-hmm. probably just step back, put away the feel of like, no, I don't like liver. And ask the right question, what are we designed for? Mm-hmm. And, and if you think and you have proof that we are designed to eat 100% uh, green, go mm-hmm. with it. I mean, if that's what you believe, that's what you believe. But if you really read um, many of the magazines from Nature and other magazines where you mm-hmm. see 
uh, proof of, or at least good questions of like, well, maybe it's not that one. So then, then you have to ask the questions or you have to reintroduce. Now, if you have a moral issues that mm. you feel like, yeah, but then the animal has to die for, for me and it's, uh, it's unfair, mm. I can get it. Uh, I understand your, your, your problem. I mean, I wish we could live in a world that you know, we could stay alive and not hurt anybody. Mm. That would be wonderful. But we are not there at this point. Mm. And um, so, so, so most likely there is something into eating animal food. Mm-hmm. Now we can argue on that. You have to be on hundred percent forever on, on on that, or you can add mm. fermented uh, vegetables and such. Yes, these are good questions. But but in my opinion, our our uh, gut system, mm. our brain is the biggest proof of this is a real really good hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how, what have you experienced personally going on a carnivore diet? And then has that experience differed from carnivore and then raw carnivore where you eat more raw? So, so the, the cleaner food you switch to, the, the, the more price you pay when you, you don't eat uh, clean. Let's put it mm. this way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's my experience. So, so anybody who wants to go to that direction, make sure that you understand that you will have very little wiggle room in the future mm. because your body starts to get adapted to, to this type of eating. Mm. Uh, and, and so basically uh, cheat day will be not really an option because you, you yeah. pay the price of it. Mm. Uh, it, it basically, you're going to be sick for, sick for a few days if you do a cheat day with, let, let's say, a you eat a bunch of bread because you know it smells good mm. so so my experience was and again this is a n1 experience so again mm. it's not a clinical experience and if somebody says otherwise that it's it's not the best way okay so maybe you're right i don't know i, I don't have to be right mm. but i know whenever i switch to to more to that direction i felt better i felt more energy I felt uh, healthier mm-hmm. and, uh, and definitely I had a lot less uh, problems to, how to say that, hunger issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in fact, that carnivore diet takes your hunger away so much you have to overeat. Yeah. That's my experience. Sometimes mm-hmm. I have to think like, oh damn i should i should eat more mm-hmm. and i just talked to sean baker about it and he mm-hmm. said the same thing like you know sometimes you have to over it because mm-hmm. if you only go after your hunger you start losing weight yeah yeah and um, I, so, I think it was a good point that he made as well or at least like a, a, a good concept that he put forth is that we're probably not made to be super big Right. I mean, maybe some uh, genotypes other, more than others. If you look at some of the old school Norwegians, they're like bears, right? I live in Norway. So some of these guys are huge naturally, but um, that it's, it's expensive to, or it, it, it takes work and intake to keep the amount of muscle mass you have. Yeah. And then especially when you're on a carnivore diet, which I am as well, that's been a major uh not a concern, but like a, something I need to think about to keep in the back of my head that if I don't eat enough, then I'm not going to be putting on more muscle mass and it's harder to maintain my output because yes. you're not hungry. And also, let, we have to keep in mind when we talk about, like, let's say the, 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 how tall the human being is. Mm. I mean, we know that 12,000 years ago, something happened. We switched to agriculture which was became more organized and and very soon we dropped about 10 centimeters from our mm. uh, tallness so which we just gained back in the last hundred years mm-hmm. but we also dropped about 10 percent of our brain right away when are we is, gonna gain that back <laughs> which is very interesting to see that but we also uh, our our uh, skeleton got different, our uh, skull got different, our teeth got different, pretty much everything got different and none of them got better. Let's put it this way. That's, that's mm. because different sometimes better. 
So, so when people are saying like, yeah, but evolution, this evolution, that, well, I got it. We somehow we survive, but we are not getting better. Mm. Yeah. But we're de-evolving in, if we're in disharmony with what you said about eating and living in the way that we're designed to. And you mentioned a good point uh, earlier that a lot of these stressors, right, they'll make you stronger. And you've also had some uh, experience with doing cold exposure. Do you want to? Yeah, but I'm a sissy, so I'm not the best with, with cold. I'm, <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'm just doing the minimum, to mm -hmm. be honest. But you, so. you had your um, experiences and you were invited to go do, or uh, either invited or you were planning to go do a Wim Hof uh, trip. I think I mentioned. Uh, I, I, was, I was at one point. I was really thinking about it, but mm -hmm. but then I started to more more study uh, Buteyko method, and then I mm -hmm. decided not to. So mm -hmm. it's I have nothing to say against the Wim Hof method. Mm -hmm. That was my personal choice. I decided to mm -hmm. to 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 go deeper in Buteyko and not just going mm -hmm. wider with learning more and more uh, breathing systems. Mm -hmm. So. So I decided to stay with, with this one and I like it. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have certain cold exposures and everything. But again, I'm, I'm not that crazy for that. Mm -hmm. I, I just do what, the, the, what I have to and that's it. The cold showers? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> or, just, uh, or just going out and drinking my coffee in the morning outside when it's minus three. Nice. All right. Uh, enough of a stressor, hermetic stressor to keep going That's in right. a way. Yeah, That's right. awesome. And you've also been, um, or I'm not sure if the term experimenting is necessarily correct, but with photobiomodulation, right, which is the use of a light on your, on your organism, right, <laughs> as we're a light bound organism. So you got into red light therapy quite some time ago, I think. Yeah, very early. Yeah, so mm -hmm. then, again, I was just reading a few researches from uh, Professor uh, Michael Hamblin, mm -hmm. and he has a lot to say about that. He's the number one researcher uh, with with hundreds, if not thousands, of researches. Mm -hmm. So it was very convincing. And whenever I could buy my first panel, I did, mm -hmm. and I'm still enjoying it. It's it's fun. Mm -hmm. Which brand do you have, by the way? um it's not a brand okay actually, so just i just bought a huge panel and i love it <laughs> okay all right great because it's um i mean for people that don't know right so we're the sun comes with a full spectrum of light and mm -hmm. in artificial light we obviously or it, it it has become less and less obvious that we're not exposed to these wavelengths that we usually or would have access to before and infrared light is a part of the spectrum that you're missing out on if you're not in mm -hmm. the sun especially in the evening in the morning when infrared is the highest and then the photobiomodulation the red light therapy will reintroduce that into your into your life right so it has mm -hmm. uh, according to the research multiple benefits when it comes to uh, muscle recovery mitochondrial health uh, even eyesight did you notice anything yourself in particular in any of these areas? I always, I always feel fresher when I do it. So mm -hmm. I know that, but some people, we are different. So some people feeling mm -hmm. sleepy right after, so they can do okay. it before going to bed. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely, there are a lot of new researches mm -hmm. on, on like the brain function, especially with the uh, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, mm -hmm. Alzheimer and Parkinson, mm -hmm. dementia. So the red light therapy is definitely there now and very well tested. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say it's a very promising direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not used yet mm -hmm. as as a full measure in the in the medicine, mm -hmm. but I think we are very close to that. Yeah, well, it's starting to gain more traction, as you said. Uh, with mm -hmm. people like Andrew Huberman as well, talking about lights a lot, which is one of the major guys in the, in the neuroscience field at the moment. So it, it's it's good to see these types yeah. of things moving forwards. And bringing this information to the people has also been, um, I think, a, a pretty big focus of yours the last few years, right? Because you've written, written numerous books on uh, several subjects. 
Yeah, basically there were a chapter about lights as well and how to mm -hmm. use it. And, and, and naturally this is for biohackers. So, mm -hmm. so the idea that how to do this on a lower budget, mm -hmm. but if you have a higher budget so you can buy these uh, bigger panels, go mm -hmm. for it. It's, mm -hmm. You're gonna enjoy it, it's no question. Mm -hmm. So even in the gym I had, we had a huge panel. So the, the athletes and players could who were members of the gym could just come in and just sit in front of it for like 10, 15, 20 minutes. And cool. they, they loved it, especially in the cold mm. winter. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been a help here in the dark Norwegian winters anyway to have the, the like the small one, the, the, the spotlights. Yes. But what made you decide to sell the gym? Because that's been a, a recent development or change yeah, in it's, your life? It's been, yeah, it's just... Um, First, because of the coronavirus, I mean, we could be mm. open uh, four months out of the tour. Mm. So with my partner, we sat down and we're like, well, it's, it's, we, we don't see how it's going to go out, but, but mm. definitely it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't work. Mm. So we got a good offer or a reasonable offer. And then we're like, okay, so let's, let's move forward. Mm -hmm. And is moving forwards for you right now, is that going to be writing more books or developing the um, podcast more? Definitely there is a book I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now mm -hmm. and, and about to finish. And hopefully it will be come, come out around September. Mm -hmm. And pretty much that's it. I mean, I mean, uh, um, in the last few months, it just, it's, uh, you know, our, our life is so much limited. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, uh, we couldn't do any trainings unless we work with professionals, like uh, almost like Olympians. Mm -hmm. So not much we can do. Uh, that we have a, a company which is providing um, education and certifications like FMS, uh, CMSC mm -hmm. and others. Um, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. because these are like live events. So, so it's getting, getting, uh, um, eventually more and more difficult mm -hmm. uh, to, to to run these companies so we'll see how it goes i mean as as much as we could we put on online mm -hmm. and that works uh, pretty well but the the face-to-face -face education right now it's it's totally limited and that's that that's one of the reasons that we decided to sell the gym mm -hmm. it makes no yeah. sense to to uh, have it gotcha all right, good. I think um, that's about it for what I had in mind to, to ask you about. So I want to thank you very much to, for doing this. And oh, from absolutely. all these things that uh, we were talking about, if you were to give one tool or like say one of, try <laughs> to say to people, try one of these, which one would be the one that you would recommend people to start with? Hmm. I, I don't really have preference to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't, I never know like uh, where to start. I mean, if, if it's more like nutrition related the stuff and you are mm -hmm. not really engaged yet into the whole thing, mm -hmm. start the, start the um, it, um, time restricted feeding, I would say like, mm -hmm. again, that's, that's cheap. You don't have to buy anything for it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get engaged in any kind of uh, sp specific nutrition. Mm -hmm. Just just do that and and find out how well that works for you. So that that's for me. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part, to be honest. Mm -hmm. As a, on a personal level, so that's a professional level. Mm -hmm. A personal level uh, for me is is to be honest, just just be a good example if possible. So mm -hmm. that's that's the the best thing. Uh, I can do and uh, you can preach anything but but if if I am a, a horrible example mm -hmm. uh, to my uh, to my friends to my family to my kids mm -hmm. then the whole thing doesn't make any sense so you know me uh, um, I'm a Christian mm -hmm. for me that's the most important part all the rest of them are just yeah. just, just fun mm -hmm. to be honest gotcha. and uh so for me, that's that's definitely the most important, and mm. and uh, to show that example to my again my friends and my family, mm -hmm. that is way beyond than talking about you know what you should eat for dinner. Mm. Yeah, leading so, 
with a, yeah. the, the right presence and the right values and principles in the world. Correct. And especially now in these days, mm. you know, people are definitely looking for answers and, uh, mm. and most of the answers are not the best answers. Let's put it this way from my perspective. Mm. Mm. Um, but I can accept if that's what you think, what you think that I'm fine with it. I, I'm not trying mm. to change your life. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm very careful to talk about these things normally. But again, um, in my opinion, the most important part is to be a good example and try mm. to be as helpful as possible to others. Mm. And some will you know, go with it and will be thankful. Some will be not thankful. Mm. That's not my judgment anymore, a decision, right? And, mm. and again, uh, I had the best uh, teachers in my life. I was I'm very, very blessed with this. Mm. Uh, people i i have nothing to say but thank you to them like yal and other people mm. but simply these these people are uh, truly living as a good example of mm. these rules even though that probably spiritually they are a different path mm -hmm. but uh, as examples they are definitely very the highest levels and and mm. it just Again, if you don't know who is a you know, Google him. That's mm. it. Yeah, I'll make sure that everything we talked about um, is in the description. So I'll have links to, yeah, everyone Thanks. that that comes up and, and AL for sure, of course. Good. Thank for you, sure. Peter, so much. This Thanks. has been very insightful and it was a great conversation. And then uh, I hope you have a great day. <laughs> Thanks. You too have it guys that was the conversation with peter Lakatos. as i said in the intro it's a lot of a lot of insights a lot of different things that we talked about a lot of different mechanisms and anything and everything in there is something that you can experiment with play around with from keto to carnivore to different styles of breeding cold exposure even though he wasn't such a a big fan right it's a it's a huge element in in my life anyway and uh, also a good means to teach yourself more about your states and breeding you know, we also dug into the accessibility of the kettlebell which would be a great tool to look into and find a place near you or an instructor near you that can help you out with that so i hope you guys enjoy the conversation and i'll see you in the next one